as the Arctic sea ice retreats, um, there are parts of the Arctic Ocean, uh, those are designated as high seas, are becoming accessible. High seas are those areas beyond any, any given country's exclusive economic zone. So effectively, anybody can do anything up there, um, unless there's a treaty that says you can't. So there's now a treaty that says you can't go up to the Arctic and just vacuum up anything you can find, um, which is a good thing. Problem is, will everybody follow it? Does everybody interpret this the same way? How, could there possibly be some kind of dispute uh, arising between countries uh, who think one or other of them is doing something that they shouldn't be? Um, so that was the, the basic question. So we were given the question, could we develop a game to explore the dynamics under which uh, you could get some kind of dispute between nations over fisheries in the Arctic? So we applied uh, the principles, some of these, the edge principles, very much the, the things Emily has been talking about. Um, so the lessons we'd learned in some other games we'd produced uh, in the last 12 months uh, help guide our thinking as to how we put this together. And hopefully we'll, we'll now sort of step through uh, and talk about how we went, how, how we did that and what we came up with. So firstly, a principle here about designing games and external validity. Uh, for it to be valid, externally valid, it has to look like the real world, or at least have the functionality, have the, have the issues in the real world properly treated. Um, so we needed to look at something that give you insights on sort of irregular behavior, um, looking at ways in which you could possibly get a dispute to arrive, uh, to arise. Um, and we need to have those key sort of real world things uh, Captured it. We start by understanding what it is we're modeling, with this very, very basic stuff. Understand what it is you're modeling, define it, move forward. Uh, so we'll go through the steps. Firstly, things that uh, the capabilities different nations have. Um, so different countries have the ability to fish in the Arctic. Uh, countries also have the ability to detect what's going on in the Arctic. They have navies, coast guards. They may even need, may need have satellites sort of surveying the area. So there's a whole lot of different up there, and we need to reflect that different people have got different abilities. Critical to all of this, though, is information. Disputes tend to arrive when two people believe two different opposing facts. Um, to allege something has happened, you must have got some information about something happened. Um, and where do you get that information from? Uh, Information, of course, if everything is known, if everybody shares the same information, you can't have a disagreement about it. Uh, so the information needs to be incomplete and possibly also needs to be uncertain. So a valid game uh, needs to have different sorts of incomplete and uncertain information uh, for the players to work with. Uh, we then also uh, recognize that uh, it's not necessarily known Sorry, information has to be maybe collected covertly. Um, a, a player, an actor who is doing something they shouldn't do may not know whether or not they've been, they've been detected. And having gathered information, uh, countries will treat that information uh, in, uh, as a small s secret. Um, they'll hold it closely. You may, you may have to think about who you want to share that information with. So the game, uh, needs players to be able to hold information, collect information, hold it, and share it without all the other participants in the game knowing what they're doing. Diplomacy. Um, different ways in which nations interact. Uh, real world states communicate publicly. Uh, they go to public uh, meetings, they deliver, make public statements, but they also uh, communicate privately through all various sort of negotiation, official contacts, uh, unofficial back channel contacts. There's all sorts of different ways that people communicate. Uh, and again, if private communication is going on, uh, all the players not involved in that private communication shouldn't know it's happening. So we need to have a method to have both public and private bilateral and multilateral communications built into the game. So to summarize, we need an externally valid game that's got to look at asymmetric capabilities of states. It's got to look at different types of incomplete and uncertain information. It's got to look at covert collection, holding, sharing of information, 
and public and private multilateral communication systems. So this is our sort of start brief. How do we design a game that lets us do this? One, two things to add in as well. Uh, if you built a highly automated rules-based game, you don't need players because there's no choices left to make. So we needed to have a game in which players have agency. Um, if you assume that a state has objectives, the player representing that state has choices how to implement those direct objectives and choices as to how to compete or cooperate with others, how to use the information they've gathered and how to allocate the resources they have. So that again um, talks to sort of the idea of empowering to a player. But we also, from the outset, this this you know process is entire. All the work has been done over the last few months um, entirely in an environment where everybody involved in it is working from home. Nobody working on this game or who's played this game has actually physically met each other face to face uh, during the time they've been working on the game. Uh, so we recognise the simplicity. Uh, that we would need to have a game that could be supported over open internet, uh, but possibly uh, something that could be turned into, a, into an in-person game at a later date, to almost going backwards rather than sort of we heard earlier, start with a game you always used to play face-to-face -face and then take it online. This is gonna, always going to go the other way around. It's going to be an online game. We definitely decided we needed to use automated tools to limit player cognitive load, increase throughput of, of, of speed, and provide a richer experience. So what have we got to? Um, well, we iteratively, iteratively developing and play testing FISH. Um, what we're going to describe here um, is the first two um, prototypes, how they were implemented, how they performed during testing, and what we learned about them. And noting at the end, we'll note there's a third prototype sort of uh, being planned which we hope to get to uh, in, in, in months ahead. So I'm going to go through some elements of the game uh, and talk about prototype one and prototype two and what we did in each of them. You will see a lot of similarities being raised here with what was in the previous panel discussion on the things you need to do to make, make games work. So the first issue we, we, we talk about here is the documentation. The players received the following information in advance. An overview brief that explained the game rules and concepts, the private brief for their state, like the country that they were going to be playing, that explained that country's objectives, um, that country's attitudes towards other states, and that country's attitudes towards the treaty. Uh, because it's possible one could say that you know, somebody will sign it, but with every intention of ignoring it. Somebody could uh, it, attempt to skew it or bend it, uh, the, the terms of the treaty, or others would be. Uh, very, very keen to implement it and see it implemented and, and reinforced. So everybody was given a different kind of sort of uh, stance to take on, on the treaty. And those objects and attitudes vary from game to game uh, because if everybody works out who the bad guy is, then everybody just watches the bad guy. I mean, if you had a Star Trek game, you just follow the Klingons because you know they're going to attack something somewhere. Uh, so we need to, we have to shuffle all the roles each time we play the game so nobody knows who is playing in what kind of role. I'm going to provide a technical job. Uh, we were talking back in this set session. We are using a mixture of tools, WebEx meetings and Slack and our own custom uh, bespoke built, built tools, Smelt, uh, which we'll describe later. Um, so we have to provide instructions to tell everybody how to connect to each of those systems and, and log into it. And for reasons that become apparent uh, soon, we had to provide people with custom identities for WebEx and Slack, so they don't log in using their regular password uh, and account number. We, get, we created all the accounts for all of the roles in the game, and you have to, have to log into the IDs we gave you. Uh, and that can be a little challenging if you're used to always hit the save password, click and you're in, because now you've got to change your identity and log in under the credentials. So how did that work? Well, prototype one, you, you know, inevitably, first draft, you rush it out, a few bullet points, um, and give people what the game designer thinks is what the key, the key facts they need to know, but proves perhaps to be a bit sort of thin on the ground. Prototype two, much better developed, um, more explanation about what the game concepts were, what the things in the game represented, 
and expanded information about what the players were expected to do. So there was, they were, well, we can look, sorry, players were much better prepared in, in prototype two. The different states, um, so we had seven, uh, seven nation states uh, represented within the game, uh, either being played by one player playing solo or two players playing as a team. Um, prototype one, they were really given very uh, simple uh, direction, uh, few, and, and uh, players were uncertain as to what we really wanted them to do. They didn't feel they had a rich enough context in which to know how to play. Uh, prototype two, we produce much better information. We provided sort of uh, background context information that might not be directly pertinent to the game, but at least it provided a richer understanding about the role we were asking the player uh, to take on uh, with more specific instructions uh, as to what they were trying to do, you know, their policy lines in the sand or lines in the ice um, and, and their attitudes towards other, other countries. So we, they were given a much better role. Turn sequence. So we looked at the idea that a turn would span a year of time, <clears throat> but we didn't really break it down and sort of put labels on what that meant. So in each turn, it would be a plenary discussion where all the nations who were signatories would all get to meet, just talk to each other in, in the open to, to uh, discuss uh, how they think the next season uh, of fisheries in the Arctic might play out or to, or, to, or, to, or to make announcements as to policies or initiatives they want to follow. There, then, there was then a unit deployment phase where people would work out where they wanted the various assets they had to go for this season. There will then be a detection reporting phase when we, when we would tell the players what their assets had observed other players doing during the turn. And then we allowed time for a private discussion so play, play, players could take on board the information they'd gathered, work out whether they wanted to sort of challenge anybody about anything or share their information with somebody. So that discussion would go, bringing, leading us back up to the beginning of the next turn and the, and the next plenary discussion phase. But turn two, um, we derived a little more granularity. Uh, we recognized that players wanted um, an extra, we had an extra private discussion phase in the early, in the early spring. We went through this and started, we put labels on for the seasons, which again provide that little bit more sort of touch points for the players to recognize what was going on. Essentially in the winter, the countries will have their discussions. They'll then plan what they're gonna do in the spring. They'll do it in the summer and then in the autumn, information will come back and there'll be further private discussions to sort of work out what to do with the information they've learned. So how do we actually manage these uh, communications well in both versions we used uh, webex meetings video conferences uh, for the plenary discussion phase the first phase of the turn we encourage states to make policy or position statements to propose collaborative ventures on information sharing you know, confidence building whatever it might be some players really got into the role play elements um, bring on the order think accent and, and, and sort of um, and getting into sort of how, how outraged and offended they were by the terrible things other people were saying. Um, but uh, private communication was also going on at the same time using the available Slack channels, which we'll come to in a, bit, in a moment. So in a, in a simple graphical term, we've got this idea of um, states A to G will have an annual meeting uh, in a face-to-face -face plenary. So then we have private communication, and this is really the heart of the whole thing. Each state was able to talk to any other state in any kind of configuration. So there are internal conversations where if a team is playing more than one player, is playing one one role, then you have a private internal planning conversation. So we created internal Slack channels uh, for, for each team. We also actually allowed them in P2 uh, to allow them to have a private, break, a private WebEx breakout. So again, they could have a conversation uh, that's in a video uh, environment rather than uh, text. We also created every possible bilateral combination of, of nations as Slack channels. So for those who may not be familiar, Slack uh, offers uh, a large number of text, different sorts of text channels you, you can have. You can be members of huge numbers of different channels. So for every, every pair of nations, uh, 
there was a channel identified, it bolts up if there's a message in it. So you instantly know whether somebody's trying to reach you. So without having to press any instructions, ask for any help from control, or even communicate with control, um, every country can talk to every other country on text. Uh, multilateral um, and on request. So if there was a request to control, either a WebEx meeting or a Slack text channel could be created um, to allow the discussion to, to, to go ahead. So pulling that together, you've got a sort of configuration here. This is an instance of what might be happening is state C is having an internal team meeting. Uh, states A, B, and D are having a three-way video conversation. Uh, states E and F are having a bilateral discussion. Um, could be text, it could be happening over Slack. State G uh, is enjoying the Timbits and wondering why nobody's talking to them. Because, not, because if you can't see the other players, you don't know who's meeting. And this is an important point in making these conversations hidden. If you are in the plenary video room, you know who's left it to go to a breakout. But you don't know who they're in a breakout with. Um, but there's no way of knowing who is in what configuration of Slack text channels unless you are in that conversation yourself. And that was the point that made at the beginning or earlier that we had pre-configured all of the all of these accounts so that each player only has access to the channels that they should have access to. So every app, uh, this one was no, no, no different. And again, following the sort of the familiar uh, rule of firstly you mock it up and then see what happens. The first map we took an existing uh, map. Um, and then just drove the top of it, putting in a number of sort of zones, color coding, sort of which country they're affiliated with. So the colored zones represent uh, the uh, exclusive economic zones of different countries, and then the larger uh, font areas represent the other uh, high seas zones. Um, and we use this as a way for the players to provide data entry. Here are little two little pictures of, of ships. Um, the players had these icons. So this in uh, Google Sheets, players had a sort of library of icons for units they had, and they moved them onto the map to where they were going to be operating. This had all the usual problems of accidentally clicking on the background, clicking on the background map and moving it off and losing all where the pieces are. And sometimes the positioning could be ambiguous. Um, was it on the label? Was it on the connector? Which one is it at? Uh, uh, so there was th th it was there were difficulties with that map. Um, players didn't like it, and the control team didn't really like it either. Um, the position, clicking and moving around, the sort of things was fiddly, um, and exactly where they were could be ambiguous. So that was not a great, not a great design. So we created map two. Uh, so this was uh, the, there's a little bit of a off the shelf base map underneath, but we drew this one from scratch. Uh, very clear color coding. Uh, we now have contiguous areas rather than an arc node type representation. Um, so we know what everything is. Everything's labeled. Every country can see color, the color codes are provided as to where areas are. Um, and there's actually a bit more granularity. We discovered on reviewing the maps that there's another piece of Arctic high seas you can get at. Um, and there are also more areas where there are actually overlaps or disputes between different countries as to which exactly whose exclusive economic zone waters fall into. I believe this area is called the loophole. This region around here is called the banana hole by the people who are who study these things. Um, but this provided um, this provided a very different look, um, and this map was not used uh, for data entry. It's simply a physical reference. Um, so. No ambiguity about what's where. It's simply geospatial reference. We took data entry into a different tool to do, so there's no markers or tokens on this map, um, and people like this much more. Units. Um, so players have a range of different units. These are the set we had for the second prototype. So essentially, there are four types of vessel. We basically have shorter range fishing vessels, unlimited range fishing vessels and shorter range uh, patrol or naval units and then longer range naval groups. Um, and then we have the possibility of putting space surveillance assets in an area. And there are various different roles you can have, the key ones being fishing, if you're a fishing boat, 
everything can do surveillance. In fact, does it whilst it's doing other things, um, but you can do other things. You can use vessels for other purposes as well. Um, the P1 set was just a little bit simpler than that, with a few fewer, slightly fewer activities, but the same five different asset types. These are very, very generic. You know, it's about representing something in a good enough detail for the effect. This is not a game um, about modeling fishing operations and counting fish. So how do we actually work these things? Well, in the first version, as I said, that the players created their own maps. So there are seven maps with seven sets of icons on them. And then the control team had to then copy or code into a tool called Catfish, computer education tool for fish, um, where everything was. Catfish would then calculate or roll the dice, if you like, um, sample the detection probabilities to determine what, what, who detected what. Well, it took 10 minutes at least to transfer the data in, uh, which is all downtime for the players and, and not good. Uh, so we then went to prototype two. We had something called the uh, called Smelt, the submission of moves by electronic link templates, uh, our new tool. Um, and this one had the players entering their positions through a effectively a spreadsheet interface, which was automatically collated into a master table, which could be a single copy and paste, put it into Catfish. It now took 30 seconds simply to load all the, all the player moves in rather than 10 minutes. Then here's the result for front end. Uh, so the players will see this, they have a couple of units. So this data is fixed. They have a fishing unit that's based in the Atlantic Ocean West. They then have drop downs to choose where they're going to go and what they're going to do. And we have this idea of a primary operating zone where you're mostly at and a covert operating zone, which is adjacent to the primary. You want to take a little look into somebody else's water or take a peek somewhere else or see what fish they've got there. And hopefully not being spotted. So this, this idea of just sort of just straying into somebody, straying into another zone for a short period of the operating season was was put into the game. So catfish we mentioned before um, does adjudic adjudicates uh, detection. So for all the different combinations of unit types and the postures they could be in, we we have a probability of a detection. Um, but catfish can just instantly calculate all of these um, and evaluate them. But catfish also has a routing data. So it knows if you, um, if you, know, you, you know every unit has a base unit location and an operating location, it automatically works out the route, all the ones you went, all the zones you went through to get to your operating location um, and can resolve all the detections as you were transiting of you or by you. So information then comes back to the players. Um, this took a while. If for the first version, prototype one, Catfish would produce the table that said what had seen what, who had seen what, but we then had to take screenshots or cut or cut out clips of information, paste them back into Slack for the players to receive the information through a Slack channel. Seven different copies and pastes um, and some reformatting. So that was again was a time consuming and messy process. With prototype two, it's reverse of the input. Um, Catfish does instantly evaluates everything, creates a table which is picked up and dropped back into Smelt, which automatically updates a sort of detection reporting sheet on all of the players' Smelt tools, um, so they get back the information completely unambiguous and, and, and error-free, again taking a matter of seconds. Uh, so looking at all this, all, all the information we have here, um, there's a lot of things were, were adjusted between prototype one and two, uh, and they're all cut, they're all coded here, but they all sort of follow a single real sort of evolutionary theme. Prototype two is superior in every way. It lowers player cognitive load uh, by giving them more information or having a feeling that there's less sense of unease, what am I supposed to be doing? There's better information about what they're supposed to be doing and how to do it. There are better and richer communication channels for them to work with. Uh, and the process, the key operations phase, when players place their instructions where they want their ships to operate for the summer season and get, then getting back the reports of what was detected, that process was reduced from 
uh, about 30 minutes to one minute. Um, and that reduced an awful lot of the uh, player downtime uh, and the player disengagement that resulted. I mean, the most of them, the players were able to carry on using Slack to communicate whilst the control team were doing all those evaluations. Um, but it does, it does, uh, uh, but, but they, were, they were waiting, 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 waiting for the result to come in. And we talked a little bit about control teams in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, panel session. I just wanted to go back to this communication slide. One of the challenges we talked about is how do you know when these breakouts have finished and how do you know that the players who are in the plenary are either waiting for something or they're just bored um, or they're busy doing something different. So we actually made sure that we had a large control team. Whenever we play this, there is always one controller in every breakout video session. Uh, they are able to provide coaching on the tools. They can make sure that they can communicate back out so they can get the breakout room closed and move the players back in again. Um, whilst there's always an eye on the open, on the main plenary, and a technical controller who is making sure the tools are working so they're not distracted by game facilitation issues. They are simply making sure that all the connections are working, all the channels are in play. So it's a, so it's a major team effort. Uh, to actually provide the facilitation and the control. The key, having given these two comparisons of prototypes one and two, the other thing to bear in mind is that when you think of a game in terms of its rules, its objectives, and the choices players have, the two games are identical. It's two implementations of the exact same game, just providing different tools. So, the way ahead. And our closing thoughts. Um, game design clearly is never finished, it just stops. Um, you can always refine it, you can always add more, uh, but the end point should be when it's fit for purpose and people actually want to use it. Uh, we aim from the outside, from the beginning, to enhance external validity by having this sort of realistic uh, variety of information, but going ahead, we want to create uncertainty. Uh, you saw the Klingon ship in the neutral zone, a Romulan in disguise. Um, maybe, 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 maybe we've missed, missed, we've got it in the wrong direction. Maybe it was heading northbound. Actually, it was, it was tracking south, but it was actually just diverting around an iceberg. So we we, we got its trajectory trajectory wrong. So we want to create not only patchy information but erroneous information. And of course, a few more things to do with the tools as well. And one of those is to is in is to have smelt no the operating locations and ranges so that players are only res restricted to valid choices. At the moment, although some of the fishing units only have a certain range from their home base, the player could put in anywhere, so they could go anywhere. Uh, it's up to the player to check how far they're going, but we can do that. We want to do that in the next generation of the tools. So what have we seen? Well, the client for the game has playtested Prototype 2 and sees great promise. They really like it, um, which is good. Um, there was, with the improved documentation, players asked far fewer questions and much more of the available time was then committed to actually playing the game. And the improved tools in, you know, really transformed the way P2 worked. Uh, in P1, most of the time was spent in deploying ships, adjudicating which ships had seen which other ships, and then telling the players what had happened. Uh, and it, so it became a fishing, a fishing fleet management game with the sort of a diplomacy phase round the wrap round the end of it. P P2, it's the other way around. It's a constant ongoing diplomatic multi-ledge uh, negotiation game with the occasional uh, update um, of who's seen what where in the in the next year's season of activities. So we've accelerated uh, the pace we have accelerated the pace of play. We'd like to press it to to, to accelerate it further. Well the challenge because it's hard to monitor, um, or I'd say we keep a monitor in every uh, in every breakout, knowing exactly when the conversation has gone far enough to stop it, um, it, 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 it can be tricky. Uh, and so the players have now sort of have now sort of gone off into a number of breakout areas. They're negotiating all sorts of things. At some point, those negotiations need to be wound up to keep the game moving. Um, 
uh, and I think if we work out the techniques to do that, uh, then, then we'll get it'll, things will move faster. We also noted that as soon as a team of two or more plays one country, the additional internal conversations uh, now take up time. Um, so ideally, every player would know how to play the game, which means they need to have a practice game and rehearse the tools before a sort of real game. And that would make it very difficult for the for the sort of um, high interest but low time availability that the senior official wants to come in to try it. Uh, that means they would be paired up with somebody who already has tried it, and that will then slow everything down. Uh, so it's, that, that's a that's a tricky design sort of conundrum we have there. Uh, we recognize um, there's this very rich conversations. I said we have the log through through Slack of all things that went on. Um, we can observe the conversations building up. Um, the control team, all members of the control team have visibility of all the Slack channels um, and can just move around and watch the conversations. And it's just fascinating to watch these conspiracies build up and people negotiate and work out who's doing what. Um, but we do also recognize as game designers and controllers who are not fisheries experts, we have to be very careful when dealing with people who actually are signatory of the people who drafted clauses of the treaty, um, the people who know um, uh, about all the various different species of fish that, that are exploited all around the world. And if they say, this is how it really is, you, you, have, to, you have to be respectful for their, for their knowledge and sort of steer the conversation into actually because it is always a, it's 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 always a challenge uh, facilitating a game where the SMEs are everybody else. So in conclusion, um, we took a requirements-based approach to designing fish, um, maximizing the odds that fish eventually will be externally valid and fit for purpose. It, it probably it pretty much is now. We you know, one more trip to to create prototype three, and I think we're done. Um, it enabled us to have success uh, in getting our play tests done. Uh, people actually enjoyed playing it, um, and the our principles based sort of tool selections sort or of the, the work that sort of underpinned the briefing that Emily just gave, uh, uh, it was really, it sh showed that it worked. Uh, now the form follows function approach uh, ought to be the right one to take, but there's always the danger of the form first approach. Um, and indeed, um, in, if, you, if we carry on with our with our fishing references, uh, the one that got away was the matrix game of fish. Uh, but in actual fact, fish the matrix game would, be, would have been a red herring. Um, yes, matrix games are great for looking at things you don't really understand or know to see how the system works. But having identified that hidden information um, and privileged conversations are the critical part of the game, trying to run a matrix game where every argument is a secret argument and every player has their own personal view of grand truth uh, would be a mess uh, very difficult so we actually feel, feel that by having this multi-layered negotiation game uh, with a very simple simply modeled sort of fishing boat operation detection uh, model has given us the has given us the solution that we needed so it does talk to this idea about as well, the design approach, I mean, designed it in 2020, uh, it's about the enabling technologies for distributed game. So our, our sort of conclusions is that game designers need to be looking at the non-traditional tools from the outset. Don't design the board game to be played on the conference table and then work out how to digitize it. Start with the digitized game. Modern graphics, communications, collaboration tools, all these things gives us different ways of doing things. Um, you could you, know, you couldn't play it without those communication tools because the dynamics uh, you know, with the multi-layered communications going on if you all have all the players co-located uh, and they say you know, country a is country b can you come into the corner and we'll have a quick chat or you can see who's having a little private conversation in the corner you know that they're doing it uh, you can't although i'm noting uh pete Pellegrino's sort of comment a while, while back what was Stephen Des Martin sort of the, what if you've got people distributed in different parts of the country having a private conversation by other means? Yes, you, you, people will communicate in different ways, but but in essence, this is not a game you could have played on the board with dice um, just gone digital. It's a game designed digital, uh, and we, we, we've got quite pleased to have to have managed to do that. 
Um, so design games that for with taking the remote and in-person uh, elements um, in design from from the out front from 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 from, from the outset, but really in this case it, it's it's a remote game. Uh, we also feel that where we come from the defense and security uh, environment, uh, that's where the bulk of our work traditionally has been. Although, as Rex has pointed out, the last few years I've been almost everywhere else I can get to as well. Uh, but we have expertise in, in in the core defense gaming world. Uh, that can be transported. We saw an example with the Agriculture and Agri-Food uh, Canada game on, hot, on, on, the, on the swine flu. Uh, this is another example uh, of people with a background in defence and security producing a, a game with working in a very, very different domain. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it's, it's making a difference. Um, so you know, serious gaming is sort of the final point here is that although serious gaming is not yet commonplace, in other domains, um, it has potential, uh, and we hope through through Connections North and other networking opportunities that uh, we'll spread it further in the future. And that uh, that is the talk. <laughs>